Hello, my name is Morris Last. I'm an educator, a network administrator, a computer nerd, a father and father-in-law to some computer nerds. My years in schools teaching technology, teaching with technology, supporting teachers and students' use of technology, my personal experiences with computers, with online games, other online interactions, along with University of British Columbia's Masters of Educational Technology program have all given me what I think is a unique position from which to view and critique 21st century learning. There are many groups calling for educational reform. Some of the more prominent groups are the Organization for Economic and Cooperative Development, the European Union, the 21st Century Partnership Group, the Materi Group, Educational Testing Services, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, the Center for Public Education, and the 21st Century Learning Initiative. Each group has voiced their own ideas on what reforms should look like, and they are all similar in some ways, yet they are unique in other ways. This multitude of calls for change is overwhelming for educators and public officials, as well as the public, creating muddied waters in which making informed decisions becomes difficult and being swept up in a current of rhetoric and emotion becomes a real possibility. I started this project with the goal of producing a review of literature critically examining the aforementioned group's proposals. But while rhetoric and opinion articles abound, a dearth of quality critical articles exist. This gap in the literature is troubling and perhaps this project will help move the discourse along. What became clear to me was that there was a need for a tool to analyze these 21st century learning proposals to see if they were financially and educationally sound. And so I developed this framework which is in its preliminary state. The skeleton of the framework is this. 21st century learning must contain new ideas, it must provide learning advantages, it must view curriculum as a grid, it must address the digital divide, it must recognize new literacies, it must include new teacher training and development, it must use a new model for technical support, and last but not least it must keep the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic intact. Let's take a closer look at each of these points. Containing new ideas. In his article Transforming Education for the 21st Century, Chris Deedy writes about the differences between changes in degree and changes in kind. I like to put his explanation in simpler terms. Proposed changes need to be real changes, not reorganizing or reiterating something already being done. Reform has to introduce something new, or it is not reform. Learning Advantages Proposed reforms must offer learning advantages to the learner. A learning advantage must either improve learning effectiveness or efficiency, or it must seek to equip the learner with skills or knowledge they need in their everyday lives. If a learning tool or technique increases the rate of learning, it increases efficiency. If a learning tool or technique increases the amount of learning by students, it increases effectiveness. Introducing skills and knowledge not already being taught needs careful consideration, though the need requirement must not be solely economic. While earning a living is important, it is not the sole reason for educating our children. Curriculum as a Grid Traditional curricula consists of lists of learning outcomes or achievements, sometimes presented as a table. Curriculum is rarely seen as a grid of knowledge and the skills needed to perform that knowledge. Mastering a subject not only includes building the traditional content knowledge, but also includes gaining the skills needed to perform that knowledge. When taken separate, they diminish the quality of the package. This is the case when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Subject knowledge should be performed through practical hands-on performances. Authentic learning performances should be assessed to measure student learning, not performances on standardized tests. School subjects are silo in nature, appearing to be self-contained, neither influencing nor being influenced by other subjects. However, life is not delimited as nice and neatly as curriculum. In reality, the boundaries between science, math, and social studies are not nearly as clearly defined as that. Not only does curricula need to be an intertwining of skills and knowledge, but it needs to be multidisciplinary in nature and it must include collaborative components. Addressing the digital divide. There is much evidence to suggest the digital divide is growing and morphing into multiple types. The traditional digital divide was between the haves and the have-nots at the hardware level, whether you had the technology or you did not. ETS suggests another divide between those that are knowledgeable or can use the technology and those that are not knowledgeable enough to use the technology. However you define the digital divide, it is not bridged until the technology is used efficiently and effectively. Putting the hardware in the hands of a learner does not bridge the digital divide until the learner gains the skills and knowledge to use that hardware effectively and efficiently. There is an increasingly apparent digital divide 
in relation to Gates' pyramid of technology. As the application level has grown, the focus on applications has become paramount, and knowledge of the hardware, operating systems, and programming has become more and more specialized. Care must be taken to ensure future learners appreciate all the levels of the technology pyramid. New literacies. New technologies may give birth to new literacies, and there is ample discussion in the literature on this point. From the various contributors' views, it is clear educational reform must include a new definition of literacy, one that recognizes the importance of performing, playing, creating, and being ethical and respectful. Perhaps students should not be considered literate unless they are fluent in communicating with others in a manner that is respectful and ethical using all common communication tools available. As with the curriculum as a grid, this definition is multidimensional, includes paper and electronic, written, verbal, and video communication, expects discipline-specific vocabulary, and allows collaboration. New Teacher Training Teacher training and professional development is needed to support the increased use of technology by students and to support the cross-discipline and skill-knowledge nature of the new curriculum. Not only do teachers need to be knowledgeable in ICT, but they also need the ability to distinguish between required, optional, or unneeded ICT use by students. As well, current research shows constructivism as a methodology of choice for effective and efficient learning, requiring new teachers to be familiar and rehearse in its use, and in finding or constructing real-world problems for students to solve, and the skills required for students to engage in cooperative and collaborative group projects. Teacher training and professional development must prepare teachers for the constructivist classroom, as well as increase their ICT fluency. Change technology support. In order to support the preceding measures, a change in technology support for schools is required. The typical corporate model used in many school districts for maintaining and supporting technology with a focus on security and restricting teacher and student use to what people outside the classroom have deemed acceptable simply does not work for a constructivist classroom. Security of data and networks and the safety of students should not be compromised, yet many strategies used by technology support teams are in place to make the technology support team's job easier, not to make networks more secure and decidedly not to make a teacher's job easier or to improve learning efficacy. Keep the three R's. One fundamental purpose of school is to teach students to read and write and perform basic arithmetic. This purpose is as important as ever and should not be marginalized in any way. ICT could allow students to navigate through school without learning to read or write, and schools could simply teach how to use a calculator, but this would be a disservice to all but the learning challenged. Much writing is still in printed form. Not teaching reading could isolate students from these writings, taking away an opportunity to grow beyond what others have seen fit to digitalize. Students need the ability to function without ICT as much as they need to learn to function with it. I realize this framework is not complete. There's a number of points that still need to be addressed. At the very least, there's distributed cognition concerns, there's a cost and affordability concerns, and there's assessment concerns, and there may be others. I hope this framework will be valuable, at the very least as a starting point for others.